I'm live? Okay. Well, good morning to my thousands of followers on the internet who I know are tuning in for this lecture series. Um, okay, I, I, I do think that's the reason. It may seem silly that I'm using a microphone being 10 feet away from you, um, where clearly I, I'm trained as a singer, I don't need a microphone, but it's more for us to be able to record it if anybody's at home on the live stream. So, um, good morning. Lovely to see you all, Shavua Tov. Um, I will be presenting this course. I've scheduled, and you'll see in the Madriach, three sessions. Um, this is a spinoff on a course that I've taught a couple of times, once for Houston Grand Opera and once years ago here at Brith Shalom. Um, and the course is, is structured uh, actually just, just like this. I'll show you here. Um, there's four sessions. Today we'll do the complete history of opera in one hour. Wish me luck. Um, then there's two other sessions that I talk about singers. I put a fourth one on there because when I originally conceived the class, uh, I did a fourth session, so I have that in the can, so to speak. And if it's something you're interested in coming back for a fourth session, if, if you get feedback, happy to come and do it. But, but the concepts of the course, the, the fourth session, just to tell you what it is, it's after we learn a little bit about the history of opera, the way to listen to it, what different voice types are and stuff. I put on just about one hour of my favorite performances of opera and just tell you why I think they're great. It's Leontine Price, it's Maria Callas, it's Franco Corelli, but they're very best live recordings that you can find in history. So that's, that's the legendary nights in opera. So if we get to the end of the three weeks and you're just foaming at the mouth and you need more content, we can decide to do that. Um, so, okay, since I have to talk about opera history in one hour, I have to hop in right away. Um, it's, it's, of course, a ludicrous idea to talk about. I actually, the, the inspiration, I had attended a lecture by Rabbi David Solomon. He's an Australian Jewish historian, and he did a complete history of, uh, a com what did he say, a complete history of Judaism in one hour. And I said, this is fantastic. And the idea was in one room, he would do a timeline as 4,000 years and, and one wall would be 1,000 years and you would, you would turn your chairs during the course and follow the timeline around you. And it, it actually, for me, was really cool because I'd studied all these concepts you know, in much more detail, but to see how they all fit into one another was interesting. So that was kind of the inspiration behind doing this. Like, I can do a whole hour on Wagner or a whole hour on Verdi or Mozart, but if we're, if we're all just coming at this art form, it's helpful to just put, the, how does it all fit together, right? Where did it come from? Opera was created, the first opera was 1600. That's roughly the date that you give for the birth of opera was 1600. So that's about 420 some odd years now we're talking about. So a lot has happened, it's a big art form. But here's what we're going to overview today. Here's the way that we break down opera history. So first, the very beginning operas, the actual first date of opera, you notice 1597, is, is what we consider the Renaissance period, the very beginning, the birth of opera. Pretty quickly after that, we move into the Baroque period. This is where you start to see maybe occasionally an opera in the opera house that comes from this period, very rarely from the Renaissance unless they're doing a Monteverdi revival or something in Europe, you almost never see operas from that first category. The second category in the Baroque, Handel, you might see a Handel opera. Certainly we all know Handel's Messiah, that's an oratorio, but he also did a lot of operas. He was an opera composer. So occasionally you might see like Xerxes or Julius Caesar, Houston Grand Opera did a few years ago. So that you might see. You, when we get into our next period, the classical period, this is where you get some bigger names. This is now Mozart. So Don Giovanni this season at Houston Grand Opera, that's a classical opera. Marriage of Figaro, the operas of Mozart. Rossini to Barber of Seville. Meyer Bear, you may not know that name. That's a lesser known opera composer, but he was an important composer in the history, even though we don't do a lot of his operas now. So those three, we'll talk about that in the classical period. That's maybe 20% of the opera that you would hear in the opera house today would come from that, I would say. Then this is really where the big bulk of opera that we know 
that, that is famous, the opera that sells a lot of tickets is romantic opera. This is everything from Verdi, Wagner, Strauss, Madame Butterfly, Tosca, La Boheme, you know, all the biggies, right, come for the most part from this romantic period. The romantic period is huge and we could spend months just talking about that. But it leads up really, and it gets more and more complex, and it builds until really World War I. That's what most music historians nowadays refer to as really the end of, musically speaking, the Romantic period. Because after World War I, things get a little weird, right? Things get modern, things get atonal, things get um, really interesting. And that's, some people would call this uh, modern opera. Some people might argue with that, but really it's important there's a distinction, opera after World War I. So that's what we're gonna race through. We're gonna get in a hovercraft, and in the remaining here, 51 minutes, we'll get through and cover as much of that as we can. So needless to say, I'm going to omit all kinds of things, and I'm sure you can come up to me and say, David, but you didn't even mention, like, of course, that's the whole point. We're gonna do this in 51 minutes. It's gonna be breakneck, so buckle in. Are we ready? Okay, so starting with the Renaissance, um, here, is the, here is the first thing that I want to teach you about the birth of opera. Um, the term about camerata is used. Um, camerata comes from the word camera, which actually means a room, and it refers to this group of musicians. So the, the story here in Italy, for any of you, how many of you have traveled to Florence? Almost most, most of us have been to Florence, Italy. So the, the, um, the beautiful thing, if you learn about the history of Florence, is that is why they speak Italian in Italy today, because it was the Tuscan dialect. It came from there. Because they had all of the money. They were the bankers. They were the, if they were the goldsmiths. You know, they, made, they were the bankers for most of Europe. Um, for a lot of the wars, they were able to finance that. So they would assemble the, the Medici family, the, you know, the great Medici family, they would assemble these great artists and thinkers, and they would put them in a room and they would, it was just this extravagance. We're having a great lavish wedding between the family of Mantua and Medici's and we wanna show our power and our authority to the world, um, come up with something great. So to understand a little bit about what was going on here, um, I want to share what was going on around the same time. Around the same time, the printing press in Europe was opening up ideas that had been locked away for thousands of years. And one of the biggest ideas dates back before the collapse of the Roman Empire. Again, I told you I'm going breakneck, so I'm explaining where I'm going. I'm going to ancient Greece. The Italians were fascinated by the ancient Greeks. And when I do this presentation in more detail, if I have two hours, I talk a little bit more about what happened with Rome and Greece and the whole thing. But the important thing for us to know is that Aristotle, this guy all the way on the right, his ideas were now being discovered in Florence, Italy, in this time of wealth and resurgence and academia. And they were trying to figure out, Aristotle, what were his great contributions to theater? Aristotle created three unities. These were things that music historians talk about a lot. Before Aristotle, plays, they would go on for days at a time. Literally, they were wild occasions and they had no sense of storytelling behind them. Aristotle codified these three unities. What he said, a play should have one action. It should tell one story. We're not gonna tell 20 stories, that's confusing. If you read the Iliad, if you read the Odyssey, these early epics, they're hard to read, right? We have to focus our attention on telling one story. Well, who's our central character? What's happening to them? We can have some other characters maybe, but it has to be clear where our focus is as an audience. Unity of time, a play should occur in 24 hours. We're not telling an intergenerational story here. This is not East of Eden. We're telling stories, right, that can be understood quickly by an audience who's maybe tired after a long day of work. Unity of place, we're not telling stories that hop back and forth between locations and require mental gymnastics for an audience. We have to tell a story and we have to tell it well. 
Aristotle's unities, an important concept. So what happened was this group of guys, and again, it was all men because that's what it was at the time, they all um, sort of thought, okay, how do we apply this, all these ideas and create a new art form? They put it in the thinker, in the cooker, and out came this guy, Jacobo Peri, who coined the very first opera. This is the opening music for the very first opera in 1597. It's an opera called Daphne. The, the opera is completely lost. We have no idea what this opera really sounded like. Um, but, and, and when most people think about the birth of opera, they will talk about a different guy. They will talk about this guy. They'll talk about Claudio Monteverdi. If you've ever heard Monteverdi, again, these are not names that you're gonna hear and see in modern opera companies that frequently. It's very, very, very rare that you may get one of these three operas by Monteverdi that will show up. And almost always, it's the third one. And I put it in its Italian name, L'Incoronazione di Popea, which is the coronation of Popea. Um, I'm gonna give you a clip from that in, in just a moment. So Monteverdi, he is the one who kind of bridges the gap between the Renaissance and moves us into Baroque. He, um, so, so Monteverdi was an interesting guy. He was working for this family down in Florence um, this, uh, you know, Medici family with this camarata, and he was working, and he took these ideas from this guy, Jacobo Perry, who creates the actual first opera. And he says, you know, it's an interesting idea, but um, I don't think I'm really into all this. I'm gonna go to Venice. I'm leaving you guys. And so he takes all his possessions, and he gets on a horse and buggy, and he heads to Venice. Um, with the intention of basically stealing Perry's idea and bringing it to the Venetian public, who had a lot of money themselves, and getting rich. And he was so committed to his idea that when he was on the way with his horse and buggy, it's a great story, to get to Venice, some thieves come out and they stop him and they hold him with a knife and he says, take everything I have. And he still goes on foot to Venice with his idea. And sure enough, he becomes rich. Um, what happened in Venice was in 1637, the first public opera house opens. Um, this is just an artist's rendering. Uh, Venice was, of course, flooded, invaded. There were fires. Things were built down. But what's important to know is by 1700, which is, again, just 100 years after the very first opera, there were 11 opera companies in Venice to the public. Think of that. 11 opera companies, that's crazy. Like, could Houston even, could you imagine Houston having three? You know what I mean? And if you've ever been to Venice, it's this tiny little thing. You're choked on this little island. It's how do you have 11, I, I still, we were just in Venice and I would like walk around these streets and think like, there'd be an opera house there, an opera house there, an opera, it would be amazing. Um, so uh, Monteverdi did really well. The thing Monteverdi, again, this is Monteverdi, the thing he's probably most known for, that third opera, Lim Coronazione di Popea, I'm gonna play you uh, probably the most famous uh, moment from the, that, that opera. It's the very final duet um, between uh, Emperor Nero and Popea. The duet is called Purti Miro. It's the thing for which Monteverdi is the most famous. What do we think? 
gorgeous, right? Yeah, it's good. Um, it's the thing Monteverdi is the most famous for. And I'm going to tell you a secret. He didn't write it. Monteverdi didn't write that. That was actually written by his student, Caccini. And it's just this great thing, like for me, when I start studying about like this character, Monteverdi, who's like walking on foot, I'm gonna get rich, he's like this, you know, he, it's like a Daniel Day-Lewis and There Will Be Blood. You know, he's a like, commit, he's Mashuga Le Devar, you know, he's like, he's gonna pursue this thing. Um, so, so Monteverdi brings opera to the masses in a lot of ways. It gets going. Um, opera houses themselves, of course, looked very different in Europe. If you go, you still have that model that can be seen in a lot of European opera houses. The original area that would be down below would be standing. Uh, the boxes, you know, then this model were often owned by the wealthy families who lived in those areas. And that's the way the opera companies, it was society, they would come to see the other nobility and the commoners would just stand on the bottom. Um, so, as I mentioned, all these different opera houses are going on in Venice. So what started happening, and, and this is also, by the way, when we start moving into the Baroque, We've now kind of covered, in, in a, as lightning rocket ship speed as we could, a couple major events of the Renaissance. Clearly, there is much more to talk about. But when we move into the Baroque, opera starts developing a form. Now, we've kind of moved out of the primordial ooze of the art form, and there develops a structure. And the key styles that you see in the period of the Baroque, there's opera seria, or opera buffa. So the way to think about it, seria, what does it sound like? What word? Serious. It sounds like a serious opera. It's pretty serious. An opera buffa, it sounds like a buffoon or something that's funny. It's comic opera. So you had opera seria was for the nobility, right? Opera seria was what they would do in courts for the weddings and things to show off their wealth. And opera buffa was to make people laugh. And that was more for the commoners. Um, you also have these three guys. I won't go into too much detail on them. Um, here's the way to think of this. Germany, France, England. Okay, because opera starts leaving Italy now. It becomes so popular that we say like, hey, we can make money with this thing and other ideas. So Schutz creates the first German opera. Lully, one of the most fascinating characters in all of European history. Um, he was born uh, Gian Battista Lully, in Italy and then moves to France and befriends the king of France and becomes Jean-Baptiste Lully and he invents ballet. Like, I mean, like he's, he's one of the architects of ballet. He doesn't, I mean, that's an overstatement, but he's one of the architects of ballet. Purcell goes to England and he becomes really the most important composer in England for like 200 years in opera. There's no other great British opera composer until you get to Benjamin Britten in the 1900s. So Britain has a horrible history of producing good opera. They have like just the worst they do. I love British people, I love British singers, I love their art song, I love their symphonic writing, but when it comes to opera, it's kind of garbage. Um, I just have to say that. Okay, so um, what happens in opera seria is this, we talked about the style, right? The style that develops is something where you have an aria, you probably all heard this term aria before, or maybe you've heard it, don't know what it is. Okay, an aria is when the character comes, it's a solo, they show off, this is my song. And it's typically not moving the plot forward, right? It's just saying, this is how I feel. Oh, my heart is so torn because I must go to war, and what must I do? And it's, there's no action happening. But it's just a moment where the character is sharing their inner world with you. Then, if you want the action to move forward, you need something called recitative, okay? And this is something that I figure I can do no better explanation than this man. Oh wait, I thought he would tell, tell us what recitative was. Okay, here we go. number of ways there's ballet underscoring choral devices and so on but certainly the most common technique for telling your story musically 
is a device known as recitativo, or recitativo, or however you want to pronounce it, a word which you certainly know as somehow connected with opera, but perhaps are a bit foggy about. What is this recitative, anyway? Well, let's suppose that I'm in a musical show whose plot calls upon me to inform my wife the chicken has gone up three cents a pound. Now, in an ordinary show, I would simply say to her, dear, chicken is up three cents a pound, and then my wife would probably burst forth into a lament about the high cost of living. But in an opera, I would sing my line, and so I would have to resort to recitative, let's say in the style of Mozart, like this. Susanna, I have something terrible to tell you. I've just been talking to the butcher, and he tells me that the price of chicken has gone up three cents a pound. Please don't be too depressed, dear. Now, that's not terribly depressed. So, um, I, I, here, let me pause, Lenny. Isn't that, I mean, that's it, right? In a nutshell, how, how am I going to explain it better than that? That's recitative. Okay, so we've all heard that if you've been to the opera, especially early operas. Now, as opera history progresses, you see less and less recitative. It becomes more integrated. But when we're talking about this Baroque period and into the classical period, and even into the early Romantic period, recitative is a big trademark of opera. It sounds different based on different composers, but this is really where it becomes. And the person who cements this format is this guy, is Handel. Handel is really our like archetypal Baroque composer. Um, Handel, fascinating guy, also a great businessman. Um, he figured out that the Church of England would not allow him to produce his operas during Lent. So he said, well, I'll just create a new art form and I'm gonna call it oratorio. And it'll be basically the same thing as opera, but it'll be about like spiritual and like holy religious characters. So it'll be like the Messiah or Judas Maccabeus or Look at all of these oratorios. Uh, Belshazzar, Semele, um, Israeli and Egito. These are biblical things, so he could still make money during Lent. That was what oratorio, that's where it came from. Um, his operas, though, and they all followed the same kind of format. And here's actually a, a page out of a score. This is, if you don't read music, that's okay. There's no, you don't need to read music to understand what I want to show you here. This is what comes from a piano vocal score. Piano vocal, which is different than an orchestral score, right? Because obviously the, the opera is not written for piano, it's written for an orchestra. But this is what a pianist would use in a rehearsal when they're working with singers, because you don't have a full orchestra in every rehearsal, right? We'd have just a piano, so they use this, they use this. Here, you notice this word, recitativo accompagnato. That means accompanied recitative. So this whole section right here is recitative, and then you get this, larghetto. This is the start of an aria. Okay, so recitative, aria, recitative, aria. So that's kind of the way that it's structured. So Handel becomes the master of the aria, and I'm gonna give you the start of this aria so you can hear what it sounds like, not with a piano, but with Handel's orchestration, okay?
hate to stop that. Yeah, go ahead. Cersei is the name of the opera. It's Xerxes. Yeah, the Persian king, Xerxes. Oh, interesting question. Did you hear the question that Susanna asked? Is that a female part? Um, that would have been written for a castrato, which we will talk about castratos next week when we go into singers and voice types because it's a fascinating history and there's all kinds of myths and legend and a lot of it is true. Um, but yeah, so, so nowadays that is sung by what is called a countertenor. So this man is a countertenor who sings in a trained register of his voice, but I would imagine anat anatomically speaking, he's perfectly intact. Let's, is that diplomatic enough to say? Um, okay, so uh, I'm, I'll, I'll move ahead now. So as I talk in Baroque opera, these two forms emerge. Um, as you could imagine, which form would you have guessed that last aria would be? Would that be opera seria or opera buffa? Seria, you're right. Yeah, Xerxes is an opera seria. That's exactly right. So again, you can see there's some characters here like features castrati. So that's Susanna, like what you were talking about. That would have been a castrato singing that. Um, basso buffo, that's the comic bass role, starts to emerge in the Baroque operas here. So, so there's, these are really the two main, main things that keep going along throughout opera. You notice now we're getting, these forms continue for a while. And the next big character we need to talk about in the 1700s is this man, his name is Gluck. And Gluck reforms opera. When we talk about opera history, Gluck is thought of as the reformer. And, and what do I mean by that? Gluck is just hanging out and he decides opera seria, this art form, he doesn't like it. He thinks it's really boring. Um, there is this rule, if you notice back on the previous slide over here, opera seria, libretti, that means the poetry. The poetry of the opera was almost required. It had to be written by Metastasio. Metastasio was this big intellectual guy who all of the opera libretti is basically opera seria during this period. If it wasn't by Metastasio, it just wasn't even worth doing. Um, and this was just a standard. Everybody just kind of accepted this and all the kings and they all would say, well, what libretto of Metastasio are you using? And he'd say, well, I, was, I wanted to do one by this other guy. And then, oh, no, no, we don't do that. So Gluck actually goes to um, the court in Vienna to premiere uh, his own opera, um, or, or forgive me, sorry, I got this wrong. He was in Dresden and the court from Vienna came to Dresden and it's the occasion of Maria Theresa, Empress Maria Theresa's 31st birthday, he writes this new opera, um, La Sconosciuta, and it becomes this huge success, but the problem was the court poet of Dresden was Metastasio. So it was this huge insult, so he gets thrown out of Vienna, even though the play is a huge success. But young Maria Theresa remembers this guy, Gluck, and says, he did this opera for my 31st birthday, like what an amazing guy. Later, when she goes to France to marry the king of France and essentially becomes you know, part, of, part of the whole French nobility, she says, I know who I'm gonna bring, Gluck. And Gluck then goes to France and blows up opera seria. His operas, really the biggest one that, that he's known for is Orpheus and Eurydice. Gluck's Orpheus and Eurydice is still performed today. To me, I, his operas still seem very old. We're not yet in the stage of operas that really speak to me emotionally. This is still too, it's like looking at an old museum, you know, and you see the Byzantine art. I'm not as moved by that. I need the more romantic, believable characters with depth of field and perspective. So what, where do we get that? It starts to happen. So Gluck, this is, you know, he characterizes a bunch of things in opera, which I'm, I'm gonna move through some of this. And it's when we get the classical composers now, the big one, the big granddaddy, Mozart, of course. He's now, now we're talking about a huge name in music history that we all know. All these different styles come out of this. Um, yeah, Mozart, I, I'm, I'm not gonna go into as much detail about Mozart as I did with, with Gluck because I think people just know a little more about Mozart or he's a name that you might you know, have heard before. But, but it's, it's, it's really worth a quick minute on Mozart. Um, he died when he was 35 years old, right? Gluck lived till he was 73. 
So the impact that Mozart had during his actual years of composition, that's always what blows my mind. Gluck had five decades of writing opera for the courts of Europe to make the imprint on history that he did. For Mozart, he had much, much less time. And most of that time, he was, sick, he was poor as a pauper. Um, you know, Mozart did a lot to expand the role of the orchestra. This is when you start getting a full orchestra in operas. You noticed in the earlier clips, it was just a few instruments playing with the singer. Mozart, keep in mind, he starts codifying the symphony. Mozart's symphonies, I mean, it was really Haydn before him, but Mozart brings it into its form. So now you get orchestras within operas. You get these great overtures. The overture to Marriage of Figaro, everybody knows. Everybody knows that, right? That's a big deal. So Mozart operas, um, the, the three ones I put an asterisk next to here. Marriage of Figaro, Don Giovanni, and Cosi Fan Tutte. I do that because it's really worth knowing Lorenzo da Ponte, uh, this guy, wrote the libretti to uh, those three operas. And the combination of da Ponte and Mozart, the, he wrote three operas with his libretti. They're called the da Ponte Three Operas. Um, they're really considered three of the greatest operas in the history of, uh, of the art form. That's Don Giovanni, Marriage of Figaro, and Cosi Fan Tutte. For some reason in this country, Cosi seems to be done a little less than the other two. Like people really know Don Giovanni and Marriage of Figaro, but Cosi seems to be a little less known. Um, but within the opera world, all three are considered masterworks. They're incredible operas. And he wrote the libretti to them. Um, da Ponte was a fascinating guy. Um, he, w he was in a, um, he grew up in Venice, and he was in a seminary to be trained as a priest, and he got thrown out of the seminary because they found out he was operating a brothel. Um, uh, so he, uh, bef he like befriended all these different people. He got run out of one town to another. Um, one of his best friends when he was living in Venice was none, none other than the actual Casanova, and um, they became big wine connoisseurs, and uh, they drank primarily Madeira at the time. Um, but uh, Mozart loved Da Ponte, and they had this great, sort of this magical meeting of these two mythic characters. After he met, after Mozart died, Da Ponte was wrecked. He actually came to America, and he became the first Italian language professor at Columbia University. Um, and he's buried in Queens of all things, that's his tombstone. So that's the libretto to Mozart's three great operas by, by this guy. Um, the, the opera that, if you're talking about opera history, that if we had to just quickly touch one of Mozart, Marriage of Figaro. Um, I mean, I love them all, I've sung all three of them. Marriage of Figaro though, what it did was it, it, it challenged the nobility in a way that was really a no-no. Because keep in mind, opera seria was for the courts. It was, it was funded by these wealthy aristocratic families for the courts of Vienna, for the courts, the Habsburgs, the whoever, right? Um, well, not so much, because Mozart's Marriage of Figaro is all about the lower class outsmarting the upper class. The, if, you, if you know at all the plot of Marriage of Figaro, the Count Almaviva is trying to uh, use his droit de seigneur, which at the time was the right of an aristocrat to, it's ugly to say this, to deflower the bride. Of, and and that, was, that was what it was trying to happen. And this is the marriage of Figaro. Figaro, it's a comedy, but he's trying to protect his bride from the count who wants his wife or his wife to be. And in the end, they outsmart him and they expose the noble count to be a philanderer in front of his own wife. And it's, it's through this, whole, and, and it was scandalous that this happened. And it did not make Mozart a popular man. He died penniless. He died, in a, he was buried in a mass grave. Like this was not, I mean, it's, it's, it's horrifying. But just listen, this is Mozart's marriage of Figaro here. Oh, 
Okay, so you can see, you can imagine even 250 years ago, like how risky this would have been. I need to get in a rocket ship, because I normally do this class in 90 minutes, so I have a cadence that I've been used to, and I've been going too slowly. So forgive me, I'm gonna move, I'm gonna move us a little quickly, but be, have no fear, because here we're now moving into what we need to talk about, right, which is the romantics. Um, key composers, basically everybody is the key composer of the romantics. They're all in here. I mean, I could have listed a hundred key operas for this, but I mean, for our purposes, the ring cycle of Wagner, Tchaikovsky, even the Russians, we're not gonna talk about Russian opera today, but that had a big influence there, what was emerging in Russia. Um, so coming out of the, the classical period, Mozart had a special influence on this man, uh, Rossini. And in fact, when Rossini was in school, they called him Il Tedeschino, the little German, because he was so obsessed with Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. Um, Mo uh, Rossini, he became uh, the architect of a period of opera that's often called bel canto. You may have heard this term before. A lot of people misuse it. The, the term nowadays, most people don't really know what it means. It really refers to a period of opera that these three composers wrote in. It's characterized by just extra beautiful uh, singing. This is where the Italians were discovering the technique of the voice. Rubini was the first person to develop the laryngoscope so they could actually look at your vocal folds and figure out what was going on the Italian tenors would start singing with candles in front of their lips, a lit candle, to see if their airflow would change the flicker of the flame as they were training. They were understanding things about the voice now that they hadn't in previous generations. And it led to some really beautiful writing, for example. pause it again in a second. I want you to hear another minute of it, but I want to give you something specifically to listen to as you're listening. Think now this is stretching the voice, right? We're not just talking about It's different, right? The voice is being expanded and understood. I'm going to unpause it and see if you can hear that when you listen to It gives you chills. This is where you start getting the opera that moves me. Romantic period in music and in art, I think one, one of my friends said it to me best. He characterized it as the music sounds like what it means. You know, Mozart, that character, like you could put some tension in the but it's a dance. It's a little court dance he's doing for the count, right? This is a man who's like surging with passion and emotion. You hear it in the orchestra, it's different. So this opera starts to move me. Um, Bel Canto, those three guys that I mentioned earlier, um, Rossini, Donizetti, Bellini, amazing opera composers. I love their operas. They're not done as frequently now because again, here, the focus was all on the singing and the music and the plot lines are really not held together well dramatically. They're not even interesting pieces, but the music is so gorgeous in them. So if you ever are just going for a drive, I recommend any bel canto opera because you don't really have to know what's going on. It's just beautiful singing. It's lovely. Um, okay, so we need to now quickly touch on the titan of opera, Giuseppe Verdi. Born out of this bel canto style, Verdi is without a doubt the most important composer in opera. If there's one composer in opera that you have to know, it's Giuseppe Verdi, uh, or as we would joke around and call him, Joe Green. 
right? Verdi, Green. Um, so when you see key operas of him, almost all of them, almost all of his operas are important operas to know. Uh, for us as Jews, of course, Nabucco is a deeply personal opera for us, but it's something that tied to the Italian spirit. Um, Nabucco, the top opera I wrote there, it was actually his third opera. His first two are not important to know, Oberto and Giorno di Regno. They're, you know, you could look them up, it's fine. But the bu first opera to know is Nabucco. This is the opera that cemented Verdi into the cultural icon that he would be for Italy. He figured out that at the time what was happening in Italy was all of these little provinces were being unified by Garibaldi and Victor Emmanuel, if you know a little of that history in Europe, and they were being unified and they were trying to throw off the yoke of Austria-Hungary. There were protests in the street, Italians were being, you know, it was, it was just a tough time. They wanted to unify as a country and have their first elections. They have Umberto I was going to be their king. So Verdi was uh, trying to tap into the spirit of the Italians wanting their homeland. And he looked in the Old Testament and he found the story of the destruction of the temple by Nebuchadnezzar and the Jews being by the waters of Babylon longing for their homeland. And he said, this is the perfect story to capture the spirit of the Italian people. And if, if opera is our art form, that is what we need to do. And so overnight, he became a cultural icon, and his name, V-E-R-D-I, Verdi, became an acronym, because Victor V, Emmanuel, Re, the R, means king, D, of Italia, of Italy. Verdi, Vittorio Emanuele, Re d'Italia. Victor Emmanuel, king of Italy. So people would chant in the street, Viva Verdi, as a cry for Italian unification. He himself became part of Italian history. Um, when I lived in Italy, I myself went to the hometown of Busseto. I needed to see the actual place where Verdi was born. It was just, I was, I, was a, I think I was maybe 23 or 24 here. But um, what I found when I got to Busseto was Verdi was actually born in a little farming town called Le Roncole, about three miles away, and there's no paved roads to get there. So, um, because it's mainly like tractors and stuff, so I got on a bicycle and I rode out to Roncole Verdi to go to the birthplace of Giuseppe Verdi. Um, this is a picture from Verdi's funeral. Um, when Verdi died, it was the third largest funeral in the history of Europe. 300,000 people came to his funeral. Toscanini himself conducted a chorus of 1,000 opera singers singing by the waters of Babylon from Nabucco. The Italian, it, the, the, the chorus is called Va Pensiero, but it, it's, it was actually, in Italy, they almost put it up to be their national anthem. And there's still a political movement in Italy today, the Cinque Stelle, the five star, that wants to make Va Pensiero the national anthem of Italy. So it, it's so tied in with the Italian spirit when you're there. Um, for the last year before Verdi died in Milan, this is how beloved he was to the Italians. They, the mayor of Milan issued an edict that said all of the cobblestone streets in a 10 block radius of where Verdi was staying had to be paved with hay so the horse-drawn carriages wouldn't disrupt his sleep as he tried to rest. He was so beloved. Um, his operas, of course, the list, we could just spend many, many weeks just talking about Verdi. Um, what I always, I, I like to share this clip because the conductor of it himself actually was friends with Verdi and that's Toscanini. So I love, I love this. I'll give you just a quick minute of Aida, which was where he really starts bringing the opera form to this large spectacle kind of, it's grown a lot since we were talking about Handel and Gluck and those guys. <laughs>
It's loud stuff. It's big stuff. Yeah, we're too loud in here. <laughs> um, so what, what, I'm just joking around. It's it's. I love this clip so much for so many reasons because it bridges the worlds to me. I feel like first of all, what you may not have noticed, the tenor Richard Tucker, uh, a nice Jewish chazan, right? He sang the opening of Jones Hall in Houston as Radames. A lot of people don't know that in 1967. And Suzanne, I know you were there for that performance. Um, we've talked about it, and that was where you met Maestro Herbert, right? Yeah, so th this, this is um, Richard Tucker was somebody who's very important to us, and the fact that Toscanini, the conductor, played in the orchestra under Verdi himself. Like, we're not talking that long ago, you know, so I, I like to do that. Um, I'm gonna go very quickly through, of course, in France, they had their own evolution of opera. These were some of the earlier, more classical French composers, Meyer, Bear, Berlioz, Gounod. You might see some of Gounod's operas done today. Faust is certainly done at HGO, Romeo and Juliet, we did a couple of seasons ago. Um, they're, they're really nice operas, but the, if you're talking about the French operas that are done more commonly, you'd get more into the romantics. So specifically this guy in the middle, Bizet, who wrote Carmen, right? Carmen is just uh, uh, every opera. It's maybe one of the, if not the most performed opera that you would see. It's such a great first opera for people. So, so these are some of the important composers coming out of France. Um, as we move into the next section here, opera verismo, this new movement comes out of Italy too. This happens towards the end of Verdi's life. Verdi kind of wanted operas to be more realistic. He wanted them to be not just about gods and kings and queens, but about people with human emotions. Like, and so verismo comes from the Latin word veros, meaning truth. So the big composer to come out of this Verismo movement, the architect is this guy on the top left. You don't need to remember his name. He's, if you're within opera, Mascagni, he wrote his big operas, Cavalleria Rusticana, which you might know because that's the opera, if you ever watch Godfather Three, that's the opera they're singing in Godfather Three is Cavalleria, which is perfect because it's all about Sicily and it's gritty and the characters are kind of peasants because it's, again, Verismo. But the big Mac Daddy in Verismo is this guy, is Puccini. Puccini picked up the mantle. So again, we're talking over this arc of time, right? We go from Verdi, and now we're moving towards Puccini. This now goes into the 20th century. So you can see his dates. He goes to 1924. His opera, Tosca, um, 1900. So that's right on the straddles here, the century. Um, other composers, Pagliacci, this is a pretty famous opera. This is the clown with the makeup, you know, who cries, the sad clown. Chilea, much lesser known today. In the 1950s and 60s, there was a period where his operas got really popular, mainly because of these singers, Maria Callas and Franco Corelli. They championed some of his works, but nowadays he's not really done. Um, Giordano, also fallen out of, out of style, but Puccini, Certainly always in the top opera billings. If you go a season or two seasons without doing a Puccini opera, it's a recipe to kind of tank your box office because everybody loves Puccini opera. Um, so the other thing we have to just mention is this horrible human being here um, who I, uh, I, I almost hate seeing his face up there next to an Israeli flag in a synagogue, um, and I bet he would hate it much more. Um, so uh, one of the most vitriolically anti-Semitic human beings in history, uh, Richard Wagner, um, and I think people mince words when they talk about what a horrible person he was, which I'm getting kind of sick of as a music historian. Like, this was a man who at the premiere of his final opera, Parsifal, ran out of money and went to the king, Ludwig II, and said, I need you to bail me out. Ludwig says to Wagner, no problem, on the condition that I get to choose your conductor. Okay, fine, great, thank you, your majesty. He accepts the money, who does King Ludwig king but a Jew, Hermann Levy. Wagner is mortified, and on opening night, he realizes a Jew is about to conduct the first performance of his opera, Parsifal. So what does he do? He takes him backstage and he tries to throw him in a vat of water to baptize him so that a Jew would not conduct a note of his music. 
Make no mistake if historians say, oh, well, it was a cultural time. No, this was a horrible human being. With that said, he was a titan in music history, and the music that he wrote changed the course of music. There's a challenge that we Jews face, of course, which I love talking about openly. I think we shouldn't be afraid to talk about this. But the history of Wagner's music with the state of Israel, of course, a lot of people know his music to this day is banned in, in Israeli orchestras. And there's a big debate around that. But what my Israeli friends remind me in the music business is when that ban was put into place in the establishment of the state of Israel, it was, again, you have to realize his music was played in the camps. And so this, is, this was something that out of respect for the survivors and the trauma that they endured to not have to hear his music in their concert halls. So it was not a question of cancel culture. It was not a question of we have to cancel this. It was a question out of respect to survivors. So that's just an interesting thing. I'd love to talk to any of you afterwards about it. The important thing to know about Wagner, um, King Ludwig II was his benefactor uh, in Bavaria. He, he was referred to as the Mad King. If you've been to southern, south of Munich is his castle, Neuschwanstein, um, which you can go, it's, it's the, the most ridiculous piece of construction you'll ever see. And every wall is painted with murals from Wagner's operas. Um, there's, there was a weird relationship between the two of them, Wagner being much older than the boy king, but they developed this very close relationship, and a lot of people have weird theories about this, but he financed the creation of Wagner's operas. Um, the, the big thing in music history, there's so many things we could talk about with Wagner, but one of his operas, Tristan and Isolde, because we're going, keep in mind, all the way to modern history, and we've got five minutes. So um, Wagner writes a chord at the opening of Tristan and Isolde, which is known as the Tristan chord, that challenged all of the theories of music. To this day, music theorists can't agree on how to analyze this chord. I'm gonna play it for you here. So that may seem kind of insignificant if you hear it, like, what's the big deal? I mean, it's a chord, okay. There are books that are written on that one chord that could, like, support a nightstand. I mean, it's wild. Like, this changed, the, it pivoted music historians, then all the rules of theory they thought established music started to evolve. They started to break down. Richard Strauss comes in, he picks up the mantle after Wagner. This is where you get these wild operas, Salome, of course. I won't play you much of this, but this is what we just had at HGO. stuff. You notice the orchestra is massive. We're now getting towards Hollywood. I mean, if you hear that in the orchestra, it's very close to the early Hollywood scores. Um, in France, uh, Claude Debussy also has a different reaction to Wagner's operas, and he writes an opera called Peleas and Melisande, which is important for opera history. Um, here's a second of this. So very impressionistic, very atmospheric, like a lot of the French artists, very surreal kind of this other world that's being created. 
This really takes us through the end largely of the Romantic period because the big event that happens, World War I, tonality, music has been stretched. We heard it with Strauss, we heard it with WC, we even heard it with the Tristan chord a little bit, but really it breaks. The disillusionment of Europe after seeing death at this scale changed everything, Belle Epoque, it's all done. So now a lot of the things that come out look very different. We get guys like Benjamin Britten, who I mentioned earlier, 250 years after Henry Purcell, writes operas about death and desolation and sadness after the war. Schoenberg, atonal operas, 12-tone, very hard to listen to. And Alban Berg, who writes perhaps the darkest opera ever written of Alban Berg's Wozzeck. <laughs> So we don't need to listen any more of that. That is Wozzeck. Uh, very dark, very dismal stuff. Um, Russia gets their own take of this as well. Shostakovich, Prokofiev, Stravinsky, they come out after World War I. Um, and then, even in America, we have our own interesting movement that seems to have emerged of minimalist opera composers. Uh, Philip Glass and John Adams. Um, Philip Glass's operas, which are hard to even think of sometimes as operas. They're often very much art pieces. Here's an example, Einstein on the Beach, a six hour long opera with no intermission. People are expected to come in and out of the theater and just kind of experience it. It's a piece of performance art. So here's Glass. stuff, right? I don't know. I mean, it, it, it speaks to some people. Some people find that really moving. Um, so opera into the 21st century, this man in the middle, Jake Heggie, just had his opera premiered at Houston Grand Opera night before last, Intelligence. So this, this is, it's hard to talk about modern opera history because there's no sense of perspective, right? We're in the middle of it. Um, you can talk a lot more with more authority about the other styles. So I've I, I did run out of time a little bit, but at the same time, I'm okay with that because I think a lot of these modern opera composers, let's leave it up to ourselves to figure out if we like them. We're gonna explore over the next couple of weeks now more about the actual art form itself. We've talked about the history, the composers, and that's all fun, but it just gives us a framework now so that we can jump in and actually say, what is a soprano? What does a tenor sound like? What makes a tenor good at Wagner versus Mozart? And we'll start doing that. Um, so notice, I, I haven't changed that from my last, it used to be 90 minutes. This is just what we covered very quickly, just a recap. Again, we talked about the ancient Greek ideas from Aristotle going to the Camerata, these guys creating the early operas, Monteverdi going to Venice, the creation of opera in Venice, how it moved into composers like Handel, down in the Baroque period, um, Gluck, how he reformed opera with Maria Theresa, challenged everything. Mozart comes out of the classical period, um, inspires Rossini and the bel canto people. They figure out about how to sing and the technique for the voice, goes over into Italy. Opera grows, expands in every possible direction, like wildfire until World War I, where it all kind of just changes, and it's in this interesting nebulous world. Um, so this is the history, again, of, of opera. Again, we'll, next week we're going to get into some singers, but I think that takes us, I'm, I'm about a minute and a half over. So I did it in 62 minutes, I think, but thanks for bearing with me.